excellent. Right, okay, um, I'm Zach Carr. I am the, well, one of the guys in charge of Lead Farmers. Um, those, of us, those of you that know us. We are a wormhole corp. We recruit pretty much exclusively from the university, with a few exceptions. But, um, yeah, we live out in a class five, and we have a lot of capitals, hence why we're doing the class. Um, Yaka is one of the um, other guys in the court who uh, organises everything. Uh, so it's his turn to introduce himself, I suppose. Yeah, um, I guess I'm one of the oldest members in the corp. Um, John, back when we lived in a C2, moved around a lot. Um, so now we finally decided to go into a C5 and obviously use all the goodies there, which include capital escalations and capital ships, which is what we are going to talk about today. Um, first of all, I mean, there's a couple of different types of capital ships, but there's only two types you actually use in wormholes. One of them is uh, dreadnoughts, the others are carriers. The reason you don't use super carriers is you can't build them in W space and they don't actually fit inside either. So there is no way to get either a Titan or a mothership into a wormhole. Uh, which incidentally also means that dreadnoughts are actually useful in W space as opposed to nullsec, where they are usually just killed way too quickly. Uh, first, uh, to speak about carriers, carriers are basically very large logistics. As you probably know, the normal logistics like Basilisk, Guardians, and whatever uh, for repping carriers is basically the same. Um, it just has a huge tank, usually about 1.5 to 2 million EHP, depending on how you fit it and um, what ship you're actually using. Um, it can deploy fighters as well. Um, big drones, um, it can deploy quite a lot of them, depending on your skills, between 8 and 12, I think, depends also on how you fit it, if you want to fit drone control units and things like that. Um, however, the DPS is only about the same as a well-fitted battleship, so you're not actually getting much out of it compared to just using a battleship, unless, obviously, you use it for repping, which is what you really want. It also has corporate hangars, um, where you can actually store stuff. Um, so basically the same thing as you know from sitting in a station, you have corporate hangars. A carrier has the same thing. You can also use it to refit ships in space, uh, change modules, whatever you want. Um, plus it has a hangar bay, so you can actually store ships in your carrier, so you can switch ships in space, which can sometimes be handy depending on what you're doing. Um, it has a pretty massive tank. It can easily self-tank capital escalations. We'll get into it later what this is exactly. Um, it also fits a triage module, which I will also explain in a second, um, and they are also very, very good uh, for fleet support when you're doing PvP because of the insane amount of repairing they do. Um, they can obviously repair much, much more than normal logistics ships, which is why they're very nice to have. Um, right. Let's quickly go into the four different races' carriers. The first one is the Archon. Let me just link that in chat. There you go. It's the Amarian carrier. Um, if you look at it, uh, you will see that it... They all get, get um, a lot of bonuses, but um, each carrier has a couple of specific ones. For the Archon, this is it gets a bonus to armor resistance. Uh, which is obviously very nice. Um, it gets a range bonus for energy transfer modules and armor repair, um, depending on your skills, up to, I believe it is 52 kilometers, both for energy transfer and repair. Um, arguably, it's the best carrier uh, if you do capital escalations with a armor fleet. Um, especially the energy transfer is very handy because sleepers nuke very, very heavily and you want to help your support fleet. Next one is the Thanatos, which I will also link. Thank you, Unar. Um, 
Thanatos gets a bonus to fighter damage as opposed to the armor resists the uh, Archon gets, which means your uh, fighters do about 5% extra damage per level of your carrier skill. Um, a Thanatos gets a range bonus for armor and shield repair, but no energy transfer. This means it's a bit less useful in pure armor fleets, um, but you can use it in mixed fleets if you want, although it is a little bit of a headache to uh, actually keep track of uh, who, who is uh, shield tanked and who is armor tanked. Fighter damage isn't quite as useful in, in PvE, uh, at least not in on the capital escalations, uh, because half the time you want uh, the, the carrier to rep and you not use drones. Uh, obviously for PvP, however, a Thanatos is fantastic, but it, because every little bit of damage means the other guy might go away and you stay alive. Next up, Nidhogger, which Sam has already kindly linked, which is the Minmatar uh, carrier. This one actually gets a bonus to rep amount, um, so per cycle of repair module, or re re remote repair module, it, it repairs more than any other carri uh, carrier. Um, it also gets a range bonus for both armor and shield repair, just like the Thanatos, and no energy transfer. Um, this one is very often actually used for repairing uh, pauses after they've been attacked, and then the uh, attacking fleet driven off. Uh, they are fairly hard to fit properly, which means they aren't used very often, even though the rep amount could possibly be very handy. Last off is the Chimera, uh, which is basically the shield pack counterpart of the Archon. Uh, it gets a shield resist bonus instead of a uh, armor resist. Uh, it has a range bonus to energy transfer and shield reps instead of armor reps. And it is probably the best carrier to use if you are using shield gangs. Okay, um, I've been talking about a couple of modules, which I will explain after I've done the introduction to the ships itself, and mainly the siege and triage modules. Um, so, okay, second ship is the dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts are basically massive, massive DPS ships. Um, they, um, if, if you fit them right, they do about the same amount of damage to a sleeper battleship as a fleet of, well, about six to eight T3s. Um, so having just one obviously immensely increases the, uh, uh, the potency of your fleet. You can also easily tank self, um, uh, or easily self tank capital escalations. Um, it's, it's no problem at all. They fit siege modules, which I will explain in a moment. Um, they aren't as great for PvP, um, unless you're shooting other capitals or shooting a pause. Basically, if it's moving, don't use a dreadnought. Thank you, Sam. Um, okay, let's start with the revelation, which is the Amarian dreadnought. A bonus on this one is obviously the fact that you can instantly switch ammo. As you probably know, on laser weapons, uh, ammo does not actually have a reload time, so you can switch crystals freely, which makes it very easy to react to sleepers closing in, flying away, whatever. Um, you have a fairly long optimal on the guns. Um, usually you will use pulse lasers. Um, you get a decent tracking. Um, so the Revelation is actually one of the top dreadnoughts to be used. Um, second one, Moros, uh, the Galente dreadnought, has absolutely insane DPS when you use blasters. Um, also has a drone bay, which may sometimes be useful against uh, cruisers if you even want to lock them, which you probably don't. But a drone bay can sometimes be handy. Um, seeing as it's hybrids, they have an even lower tracking, uh, so it's a little bit harder to hit the sleepers, but when they do, they go away very, very quickly. Uh, next one up is the Naglfar, which is awesome just because it's vertical instead of horizontal like everything else. This one can probably be shield and armor tank both, as far as I'm aware. Uh, we don't really use Naglfars. 
Um, drawback with the Nagel 4 is the fact that it uses split weapon systems, so you need to train two weapon systems up to capitals, which means it uses projectile weapons, either autocannons or artillery, and it uses cruise or cruise missiles or torpedoes, both. Uh, so obviously it takes longer to train for these. Last one up is the Phoenix, the Kaldari Dreadnought. Um, on the good side, obviously it gets good range with missiles, as you know in PvE. Um, problem with the Phoenix is uh, you uh, actually need to target paint sleeper battleships as well as web them down to get any sort of decent DPS out of it. Um, just because of the the, the way the, uh, the missile works with the explosion radius and the siege module drawbacks, which I will explain in just a second. So I think the Phoenix is probably the least good dreadnought for uh, for running sleeper sites. Okay, um, let's get quickly into siege and triage modules. Uh, siege, uh, let's see, triage modules first. Uh, triage modules are fit onto carriers. Um, and they are pretty much a must-have if you want to do capital escalations. Uh, first of all, they require strontium to operate. They use a certain amount of uh, uh, stront per cycle. Cycle time on a triage module is five minutes. Um, during these five minutes, a carrier cannot move. It can't warp. Uh, and it can't use any drones or fighters while in triage mode. So it is basically a sitting duck. So before you enter triage, you want to make sure uh, you can actually sit there for the next five minutes. Okay. Uh, also, a triage carrier can't receive any sort of external effects. Um, so no remote repair and no energy transfer. So it's basically on its own. However, obviously, you're going to get a lot of bonuses because otherwise there would be absolutely no point to this module. Um, both local and remote repair, so your local tank and your remote tank, um, is boosted by 100%, plus the cycle time of those rep modules is reduced by 50%, which in total gives you a 400% bonus to rep amount. Um, per time unit, basically, both for local tank and remote tank. The other bonus you get is a triage module increases the scan resolution on your carrier by a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, a triage carrier is a, has about the lock speed of an interceptor. So, uh, yeah, anything can be locked very, very quickly. The other thing is, when you triage a carrier, it's immune to E-war, so you can't ECM it, you can't warp scram it. Um, what you can do is you can mute it. Um, obviously, faster cycle time on the rep means uh, higher cap consumption, because obviously you're running your module more often, so this is something a carrier pilot needs to be well aware of when when he's, uh, he's putting his carrier into triage mode. Okay, next up is the siege module. Uh, these are fitted to dreadnoughts. Uh, they also need strontium to operate. Uh, cycle time on the Dreadnought Siege module is 10 minutes, which is even longer, so you'll be a sitting duck for at least 10 minutes, which is, a, well, quite a long time in W space, I suppose, sometimes, especially if you suddenly see probes on these scan that shouldn't be there. Um, obviously, it can also not move or warp during this time, can't receive energy transfer, can't receive remrab. Um, what it also does is it reduces turret tracking and explosion velocity, so uh, explosion velocity of the um, uh, missiles, by a big amount, I believe it's 75%. So you can see why it would have a difficult time tracking anything, and we'll get into the problems with that a little bit later when we're talking about the tactics. Uh, scan resolution is nerfed as well, which means that it takes ages to lock anything. And you can also only have two active targets locked at the same time. This can't be increased by, uh, by skills or anything, so you want to make sure that you know what you actually want to shoot, because uh, even sleeper battleships take like 25 seconds to lock up. Uh, bonus is also rep amount. Um, there has to be good bonuses to it, otherwise you wouldn't use it. 
Um, so you get the same same reprimand bonus as the carrier does, and an immunity to E-War as well. Biggest bonus, however, why people usually use the Siege Module is the fact that you get a 625% bonus to turret damage. Which means that your average Dreadnought is going to, well, do roughly four to 5,000 DPS on a sleeper battleship. So, yeah, you can kind of see how that would be very, very nice. Okay, that was um, uh, a quick introduction to what capital ships there are, how they're used, uh, what kind of modules are important for them. Um, let's see. Uh, next one is how do you get capitals inside high-class wormholes? Well, um, as most of you probably know from low-class wormholes, the only way to get a capital in there is to build it inside and then it's basically stuck. This is not true for class 5 and class 6 wormholes. Um, you still can't get super caps. As I uh, said before, you can't build them in W space because they actually need sovereignty to be able to build and you can't claim sovereignty in W space. Um, also, their mass is too big, uh, so you can't actually jump them through a wormhole. Uh, however, there are capital-capable wormholes. Uh, they go from uh, null sec to C5 or C6. They go from null, uh, low sec to C5 to C6. And they go from C5 to C5, C5 to C6, C6 to C5, and C6 to C6. Those are all capable, uh, capital-capable wormholes because they have a uh, maximum jump mass of 1.35 billion kilograms and a carrier or a dreadnought are 1.1 or 1.2 billion so they can jump through uh, just as a comparison a super carrier has 1.5 billion so as you can see it's too big so it won't fit um, as I said before as well in C4 or lower you have to build them inside the wormhole because wormholes uh, into those classes are always too small, they usually have a maximum jump mass of about 300 million, so you will not be able to jump a carrier or dreadnought through. Now, uh, to get a little bit more into connecting this to W space, um, what are capital escalations? Well, first of all, they only work in class 5 and class 6 wormholes. Anything lower, that capital isn't going to do a lot except for being good for system defense. Uh, they work on anomalies, radar, and mag sites. What happens is, uh, f first carrier to land on grid with the site, so just initiating warp is actually not enough. Carrier lands on grid, it will spawn six additional sleeper battleships. Uh, if you then warp in a second carrier, it will spawn another eight. Um, after that, you can warp in as many carriers as you want. Uh, the extra carriers will not spawn extra battleships. Same goes for dreadnoughts. First dreadnought to land on grid will spawn six sleeper battleships. Second dreadnought will spawn eight. This in total means 28 extra sleeper, ba sleeper battleships. Um, important to note here is that as long as you don't spawn more than one wave at a time, uh, your capitals will be fine. If you spawn two or more waves at the same time, things will get very hairy very, very quickly because the incoming DPS is then insane. Uh, why would you do this? Well, and it's a huge uh, increase in income. Um, to take an example, if you use an unescalated C5 anomaly, which is called a core garrison, it's worth, well, roughly 250 million ISK. Uh, it depends a little bit on your luck with the MNRs and stuff, but, but in general, that's about the rough number. Now, if you run a quad capital escalation, meaning you spawn all 28 battleships, um, the same site will have a value of around 1 billion ISK instead for one site. Um, you complete this site with a 10-man fleet using dreadnoughts, about 40 to 45 minutes, depends a little bit on how good it goes. So, ISK per hour wise, for people who uh, like this, is about 100 to 125 million an hour, roughly, for uh, 
10 man fleet, maybe a bit more, um, but obviously you have to scan down and, and salvage as well, so that takes a bit of time. Uh, thing to note about these, especially quad capital escalations, is you can really only do this in your home wormhole because um, you can't really bring out more than one capital into your static because of mass issues. Uh, your usual capital capable wormhole has a mass of 3 billion kilograms, means you can jump a carrier out and jump a carrier back, and that's pretty much it. Then you are very close to having it critical, so you jump out two capitals at the same time, one of them is going to get stuck on the other side. Um, let's see, right, let's go a little bit into tactics, um, at least for the sub-capitals. Uh, Zakhar will take uh, part of the capitals uh, afterwards. As I said before, uh, sieged dreadnoughts have very, very bad target tracking. You have the capital sized turrets which have bad tracking to begin with, and then you have the drawbacks of the siege module, which makes it even worse. So they are not going to be able to hit a sleeper battleship without help. Now, this is where the support fleet comes in, because just warping the capitals in isn't actually going to work. Um, you will not be able to really bring anything down in a useful time frame. So part of the support fleet, especially for the dreadnoughts, is ships that use webs. Um, you want ships with a long webbing range, which means uh, very good for this are Minmatar recons, uh, because they get the bonus to webbing range and also target painting, which is useful if you're using a Phoenix. Uh, the other ship that is very, very good for this is a Loki with a webbing subsystem, as that webbing subsystem also gives a bonus to webbing range. Um, I will link my current Loki fit in chat. Um, if you look at it, um, you will see that it has faction webs. This is to increase the range on the webs. Um, Overheated, the webs have 34 kilometers range, and overheated, they are 26.4. This obviously means you can start webbing down the uh, battleships faster, meaning the dreadnought can shoot quicker earlier, meaning you will get the sight down uh, faster, which is obviously what you want. You want to sit around as less as possible. Um, yes. Uh, other webbing ships may work, um, but obviously high range uh, on webs is the best thing you can do. Uh, also, if you fly a dreadnought, it does not shoot cruisers or frigates. It is, quite frankly, just a waste of time. It's not going to hit them, and it will take about two minutes to lock them anyway. So, yeah. Zakar, you want to get into tactics a little bit? Yeah. Um, but right, okay, well, let's assume that you'll want to get online tomorrow and start running a capital escalation. You've already got stuff there. Um, first of all, the, fir the very, very, very first ship that goes in is a triage carrier. There's no question about it, you know, because you've got to get that support fleet in. You've got to make sure that you're able to keep it alive. So the first one that goes in is your carrier. Uh, you then get your support fleet to walk to the carrier. Your carrier's already triaged. So, of course, you can get your support fleet locked up. You can start repping straight off the bat there. Point of, of your uh, initial support fleet is to get down those first six sleepless guardians, which are the battleships which spawn for capital escalation. Now, they're tough. They've got a lot of health, they've got a lot of resists. I think it's about 75% resists across the board. Any damage type you do. Yeah. They all web, they all scram, and they all noz. And they hurt you hard with the noz. Um, best of, bit of advice is try, if you're flying a subcapital in those sorts of situations, is to make sure your tank is not active. Um, that's energized adaptive nanomembranes, that's passive shield resist modules, that sort of thing. Because if they shut your tank off, yeah, the carrier's going to have a really strong to wreck you. And in the worst case scenario, you explode. Uh, I speak 
first hand knowledge of this. Um, so yeah, you wanna get your support plate in, start knocking down those those sweeps guardians. Uh, again, webs very, very, very important. Um, yeah, and so going back to the NOS thing, this is one of the reasons why we tend to use Narcon a lot, is because the energy transfer makes things a hell of a lot easier. Um, I mean, it it does require thinking on your feet an awful lot, because the wave, the escalation wave, will always target the same person. They'll switch targets, but all six or eight battleships will go for the same guy pretty much. Um, it's rare that they do spread aggro, but it does happen. Uh, you're looking at your average T3 heavy assault ship, something like that, you know, just cap's gone in an entire cycle. So of course, you, know, you need to be looking at your broadcast, pulsing your, your um, energy transfer there, and you can keep people up. Uh, so obviously that's why we tend to use Narcon a lot more. Once you've got those first six down, the next thing you want to do is bring in the Dreadnought. They do a lot of DPS. You only have to deal with another six battleships. And then for the remaining 16, you've got, you know, essentially double the DPS of your fleet. Now, um, now Charlotte was talking about uh, Dreadnought fittings, that sort of thing, and obviously how they have to have a lot of tracking computers and their targets are going to be webbed. With, hang on, I've forgotten the chain of thought now. Second. But, so, what you want to be doing is you want to be having your support fleet work on one target and your Dreadnought and a Weber working on an additional, a different target, simply because the lock speed. You know, you can only keep two targets locked, and if you don't have a SIBO, which a lot of the time you won't because you're going to want the extra tracking, um, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is end up spending a minute and a half locking a target only to find that it explodes. You yeah, know, that's pain in the backside. Yeah. So, you've got those next six down with the Dreadnought. Now, um, yeah, this is where it starts to get a little bit hairy. You know, six battleships is fine. Eight, bit tougher. You always got to remember that you're also uh, dealing with the actual site itself as well. Um, this is why we tend to like call garrisons because we can just drop the capitals in straight off the bat before we've even you know knocked out the actual site and work our way through. Um, rule of thumb: don't touch the actual site until you've dealt with the capital escalation wave. The actual site itself will probably take you about six, seven minutes to get rid of once you've got all those capitals in there because your carriers are dropping triage, uh, they're deploying fighters, you've got additional DPS there, you've got a lot of um, dread, you've got two dreadnoughts, you know, minimum generally, which are doing a lot of DPS and the standard site battleships are a lot, lot weaker. Um, so yeah, you, what you do, you bring in sometimes another dreadnought, some of these, you know, whichever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, you know, if you feel like a little bit of extra rep, you drop a carrier in as, as your third capital, and then you drop your fourth one in. Um, let's say those eight battleship waves are a little bit tough, but you know, the most important thing is to just kind of keep you cool. Um, the main thing, especially if you're doing triage carrying, is to watch your capacitor. You, the one thing you cannot do is dump a repper on, dump all your repers on someone, leave them. Yeah, you know, it won't work. You'll run out of cap, and everyone will die. You've got to, you know, pulse your repers. You know, really sort of look at conserving your cap because, you know, you are the only rep there. If you run out of cap the entire fleet dies. And it's very, very easy to forget that you've got something on on a carrier that's in triage. And because of the halving of the cycle time, you're burning up an awful lot more cap. It's very easy to over-rep 
and it's very easy to fit you've got stuff on so that is probably the most important thing you're doing there um from a sub capital point of view the most important thing that you need to do is make sure that you're within range of the carrier um when a carriage goes into triage it can't move at all unless someone bumps it which is annoying um that means that Subcapital ships cannot stray any more than 45 or 52 kilometers, depending on you know your skill level. For example, I've got carrier four, so when I'm doing triage, people can't stray more than 45k away from me, or else they will explode. Um, it's very it's very easy to forget. Um, I've lost ships myself doing it. I've not been paying attention. I've strayed 20k out. Of course, the waves all switch, switch to me, and the moment that you get six webs and six nozzles on you, all of a sudden, you can't fire up your micro walk drive, you can't get back into range and you explode. So, that's the most important thing there. Um, the most important thing to note, really, is that they are very worthwhile doing. Um, I actually, I tend to keep track occasionally of the amount of time that it takes to do a site now. If you, if you don't have capitals to do a C5 site, you need two lodges, sometimes three, depending on what site you're doing. For example, each class of wormhole has got an easy mag and radar site and a hard mag and radar site. Yeah, you can't do the hard ones with two lodges, it's very difficult. You usually end up losing ships if uh, people don't pay attention. Yeah, you can do them if you're on the ball. But, yeah, I wouldn't advise it. Uh, but with about 10 people, you're looking at getting a basic site done in about 20 minutes. If you have, if you quad cap escalate it, and you've got two dreadnoughts there, you're looking at doing the capital escalation and the site in about 45, yeah, on average. Now, obviously, you know, 20 minutes to earn 250 mil, 45 minutes to earn a billion. You know, you don't really have to be a prize-winning mathematician to work out which one's better. The only problem with this is, and I know we've touched upon wormhole mass limits before, is, well, it's wormhole mass limits. Realistically, you can only drop one capital out of a work into a different wormhole and get it back again. You know, if... You're only taking capitals out, and it's a one-way trip. You can get three. Um, so if you are going to be wandering into systems next door, your best bet is to take a carrier. You know, but um, in your home system, for example, you know we live in a C5. We're connecting C5. We tend to only do capital escalations in our home system. Uh, we don't tend to do a lot of combat sites next door we do occasionally but due to the amount of time that it takes and you know the reasonable amount of sites you can support yourself reasonably well with them um what i will go over a little bit now is what happens in a pvp situation without wanting to put it too bluntly if you get dropped with a capital inside a combat site, there's a very, very high chance that you're all going to die. Um, people would, te would tend to not drop the fleet with capital support in wormholes unless they're pretty sure that they can win. You know, because you'd be crazy otherwise. What this means is that there are going to be a lot of new ships there. Uh, the easiest way to take out a capital is to get rid of its cap. This is why I was going over cap management earlier. Now, you see a lot of Balgorns, you see a lot of Apox fit with newts and cap boosters, that sort of thing. If they drain your cap, your carrier is useless. Um, the vast majority of, a, of a, certainly a carrier, I'm going to talk about carriers because it's easiest. Uh, the vast majority of their tank is in their capital armor, armor or shield wrappers. You know, they 
I mean, obviously some of them do have high resist, like the Archon, for example, but you know, the reason they can tank so much is that they can just repair so much damage. If you've got no cap, you're not repairing, you're exploding. So, yeah, if you get dropped, uh, there's a reasonable chance that you're going to die, I'm afraid. Uh, which is why you need relatively good operational security, which uh, myself or Yaka will go over in a bit. Um, in the event that you do get dropped, the most, the worst, the very worst thing you can do is run. Basically, you know, have your subcaster ships bugger off because you know that just means that. You know, no one knows what's going on. You end up being very disorganised, and everyone dies. Uh, especially if they got hit to there, that sort of thing. Um, what you need to do is you need to keep your cool. You need to have a bit of a think. The thing is, is certainly for a good five minutes or so, your capital will be able to keep everyone, including itself, alive. No doubt, it is very hard to kill ships that have got capital repairs on them. Um, the way that we've killed captors in the past, uh, we haven't lost a captor yet, touch wood, uh, but the way that we've killed captors in the past has been basically just, you know, having a bit of a war of attrition and seeing who runs out of cap first. Um, so yeah, the most important thing is to, you know, everyone get back to the carrier look and see what's muting down your capital ship. You know, that is what you need to get rid of first. Yeah. Um, you know, if people run, you know, you're not doing that, you're going to lose capital ships. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at the end of the day, you just need to get a bit of a grip of, on things. Don't run off. If people need to reship, Go back reship. Um, ECM is always a big favourite in these sorts of situations. Um, it very much depends. You know, you just need to have a bit of a think about what the other guys are bringing. Really, um, it's all one good going away and getting free scorpions. But if they've got another triage carrier, you can end up with a stalemate, and eventually one of you can run out a cap and chance that's going to be the, the carrier that's been sat in the site. You know, because it's already at a lower cap level. Uh, on the other side of things. If you are the aggressor and you've got capital support, good on you. Um, you know, you're in a, in a very advantageous position. Um, but all of fun, though, don't triage. You'll die. Um, you know, you want your fighters out. You want the extra bit of DPS. Generally, you can keep people alive. Um, you know, and again, with the triage, just don't do it because... Unless you've got a really, really good plan, you're going to explode. Um, I personally don't really like bringing carriers too far out of our wormhole for PvP. Yeah, there's always a risk that they're going to get stuck, that sort of thing. Yeah, but for system defence, it's always quite nice to be able to drop three or four of the things. Um, or an enemy fleet, because that really does make them think twice. Whatever you do, don't bring a Dreadnought to a PvP fight in wormhole space. If it won't work, you'll lose it. Uh, it. They are absolutely fine tracking a sleeper battleship that's heavily webbed at 50 kilometers. They are useless, absolutely useless, engaging uh, something like a Zealot that's orbiting you at 10k. You know, you... You, I mean, you might get a bit of use out of it as a bit of a meat shield, but at the end of the day, just don't bring it. You'll be far better off bringing something else. Um, I think that really sort of covers the most of sort of situations that you would use capitals. Um, I mean, we operate our capitals out. I mean, obviously, we live in a wormhole, so we operate out of a central base in W space. We've not really had much call to move in to other systems with capital ships to run sites, so that sort of thing. Um, so I can't really vouch much for that. But again, you'd run into the same sort of limits where you've got <coughs> where you've got um, 
you know, only one capital ship there. Um, it is useful because, you know, that way you've only got one person doing logistics and not two or three, uh, which is if you're being a small group, um, like we were when we first started out, you know, we would uh, often have a bit of an issue getting a fleet together simply because we had, you know, we'd have to have three logistics ships. Uh, if you've only got six people online, that's free logistics, that's free DPS, it's going to take you forever to do anything. So it does have its advantages of just running in with one carrier, but it will be a carrier, it won't be a dreadnought. Um, one thing we do see a reasonable amount of is people running sites in just two or three dreadnoughts. Um, don't do it. You know, they are the easiest, easiest kills to get because they've got no support fleet there. They've got, you know, they can only bet themselves. You know, you can basically just steamroll over them. Um, you know, you need a support fleet there. You need to be in a reasonable corporation with a reasonable number of members to be doing this sort of thing effectively, you know, and not risk losing it. Uh, you don't need to pimp fit. A capital ship, you can do if you want, but you don't need to. Um, you know, you know, with when you're actually repping again in a carrier, going back to those, you will only really need one repper to run there, yeah, run one repper on one heavy assault ship or T3 to keep it alive. You know, you won't need to run three. Um, I usually fly with two, so I can switch between targets. Um, I tend to run with, in my Archon, I run two armor repairers and two energy transfers, and a triage module, those are my high slots, uh, which basically means that I can uh, provide rep and capped people and actually have a free repper to switch, you know, quickly. But your cycle times are relatively short anyway, they're about two and a half seconds, so even then that's not much of an issue. Uh, There's one other thing I was going to say, it was important, but I've forgotten it now. Um, I'm sure I'll think of it. Uh, right, Yaka? Yeah, um, one thing I may uh, comment on is ECM using Scorpions on sites. Um, there's quite a lot of tactics where people use Scorpions uh, to, uh, and ECM to reduce the incoming DPS. Um, basically, uh, my comment is that especially when doing capital escalations, don't. Um, problem with ECM is it makes the uh, sleeper battleships fly away from your fleet up to about 120 kilometer distance, which means your support fleet isn't going to be able to reach it. Your dreadnoughts probably can't hit out that far. So it's just actually making the site take longer, especially since a carrier can usually um, uh, can usually deal with the incoming damage anyway. Um, so, so the ECM is just, it's just a waste of time, basically. Um, other thing to note is when you run the capital escalations that you want a small SIG radius, if at all possible, meaning uh, Tech 3s and hacks are usually preferred over battleships. Battleships do work, uh, but if you bring too many battleships, uh, the carrier pilot is actually going to start to struggle because the battleships take much, much more damage. Yeah, my two cents on, on that is, yeah, don't Try not to bring battleships if at all possible. I mean, I hate having too many bat. I don't mind having one or two, but I hate having too many battleships in my fleet because they just take a horrendous amount of damage. Um, when I said, you know, you only need one rep to keep one person alive, uh, that's if that person is in the hack or T3. They're taking a lot less damage. Uh, they've got a lot higher resistance. and they've got a lot smaller SIG radius. Um, a battleship, we've had situations where we're actually having to run three triaged capital arm reppers on a battleship to keep it alive. Um, as I said before, capacitor is an issue. You know, you do need to watch it. If you're having to do that for two or three minutes, you're looking at capping your carry out, and that's bad. You don't want to be doing that. Yeah. However, I do realise that probably a lot of the listeners here uh, have not so many skill points, so tech threes or hacks may not quite be uh, an option yet. Uh, so if you do want to bring a battleship to something like this, 
um, you will want roughly at least 20k armor HP, so not EHP, but actual armor hit points, or shield if you're looking at shield fleets, but and you also want good resist, so I think the number is about 70% across the board. Or, yeah, uh, over the board. Yeah, yeah, otherwise what's going to happen on is that you will simply be off and down before the carry can even start wrapping you. It has happened. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you do fly smaller ships, you want to have a certain understanding of how target tracking and explosion velocity works. Um, and also, of course, how speed and sig radius tanking works, because that is a big part of flying these ships. Um, so, uh, especially if your hack or your tech 3 is getting offered by eight sleeper battleships, um, sometimes manual piloting um, can actually save your ship if you make sure your uh, speed is as high as possible, you uh, maximize your transversal, uh, all those kind of things, just to make sure that you take the least amount of damage. This is this can make the difference between your ship going boom and it surviving without any problems. Uh, right, we've already covered the uh, PvP part. Um, closing wormholes. Uh, that's an interesting one, actually, seeing uh, capitals have a high mass. Um, basically, uh, if you live in if low classes, closing a wormhole is, well, usually fairly annoying. You have to jump out orcas and battleships all the time, and it just takes bloody ages. Um, you have a capital-capable wormhole, what you do is you use a carrier or a dreadnought, it doesn't really matter. Um, jump it out, have it wait on the other side, have, with the carrier at least, four battleships jump out, two use a prop mod, meaning an afterburner or a micro-warp drive, two don't use one, um, have them jump back, and then jump the carrier back, wormhole is closed takes about one minute if you want to do it quickly. Uh, why a prop mod? In case you don't know, both a afterburner and a uh, micro warp drive increase the mass of your battleship by 50 million kilograms, um, which means that those four battleships in total actually get a mass of about 1 billion kilograms. Seeing as the carrier is 1.1, um, having them jump twice puts you to 2.2 plus the 1 billion from the battleships puts you at 3.2 a normal capital capable wormhole only has 3 billion kilograms of mass so there you go an automatic close pretty much riskless unless you kind of screw up your counting um, yeah I think that covers most of the things about capitals and wormholes unless Zachar has anything to add? Uh, no, I think we should probably take some questions, really. Um, yeah. So we'll be last sat here babbling on about it, but yeah, let's find out what people actually want to know. Um, but okay, I suppose we'll yeah, we'll take some questions. Yeah, you can ask both in lecture e uni or I suppose you can ask on Mumble as well, but do try to uh, not shout through each other. Any questions at all? Can I have Starbase config, please? No, you no. cannot. Balls. <laughs> uh, one question. How would you get a capital ship into a wormhole that is not capital capable? In other words, into a C-1, 2, 3, or 4? The only way. You would have to build it. Um, the easiest way... I'm going to have to remember this. It's been a little while since I've done it. Uh, basically, you can either bring the capital parts in or you can bring the raw minerals in and construct the capital parts. I think it's easier to bring the raw minerals in and construct the, cap the actual capital parts there and then assemble those parts into a fully functioning capital ship because the size is considerably smaller. Um, I think you're looking at about, I think we worked it as about 16 to 20 or close, depending on what you wanted to make, um, or about... 10 or 11 um, if you were just using the minerals so that would be the only way to do it um, also as has been said before in the lower class of wormholes 1 to 4 uh, if you warp carrier or dreadnought into a site you will not get those escalation waves you will not get the extra money there it's only um, uh, it's only the uh, higher class wormholes 
they are still useful for system defence. Absolutely, yes, yeah, they are. They are very handy. Uh, they do make people think twice. Um, obviously, it is a bit of a double-edged sword if you're dropping, a ca- if you're living in a C2, for example, and you're dropping a carry on uh, a couple of guys. They might, you know, they might think, "Oh, carrier, run." Um, they may also think, "Oh, this is the opportunity for an awesome carrier kill." So they may bring back more friends. So obviously, yeah, double-edged sword there a little bit. Um, next question. Do raw cows spawn capital waves? I don't know. I don't know, I'm afraid. Uh, afraid rogue. You shouldn't even be asking questions in this. T- to be honest, I don't think they do. Although, well, I don't think we've ever yeah, tried. I don't... I don't I... Personally, I don't think they do, because you, don't, you only ever hear about frog capital escalations, you never hear about sex capital escalations. Best yeah. capital escalations. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, no, we, we do all kinds of stuff in our wormhole, obviously. I mean, we do a lot of PvP, uh, of course. Um, some of us like to gas mine. Um, yeah, I don't think we do pr- a- actual mining. I think we just despawn the graph sites, to be honest. Nobody bothers. Yeah. Um, just have a look in the actual chat. There's a bit of chat going on about, um, you know, how we sort of recruit that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I'm going to do a shameless uh, recruitment spiel uh, very quickly. Um, we do take people. Uh, we... A bit like uh, it's been said by Trekkie. Um, it's you know sort of a around about one month thing to go into our holding court based in the wormhole. Um, you know it's pretty much the same. It's more of a security thing. Um, you know, we sort of, um, plus we like to get to know people. Um, as far as actually living out in the wormhole goes, you pretty much have to be a relatively tight knit group of people because you know you are having to spend a lot of time with the same people, um, wormholes, tend to, you tend to struggle with very large corporations, so, we, you know, and plus with the actual pos management issues, which uh, is something I do tend to take advantage of a little bit too much, um, it is problematic keeping everyone's stuff out here, so we do tend to take people who are active. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we do have our own channel. It's uh, just L Farm in the game. You know, if you're interested, you want to chat to us more about it. Yeah, you're more than welcome to drop in there. We're all reasonably nice people um, at times. Um, so yeah, pop yourselves in, have a chat. You know, um, and yeah, if it's sort of thing that interests you, then great. Uh, I personally think that it is the best part of the game. Um, but that's because I prefer small gang PvP uh, rather than blob fests. Um, if you are interested and you sort of think, yeah, I kind of want to go out to wormholes, but lead farmers kind of seem like assholes. I don't really like those guys. Um, then you'd be you, correct. Yeah, you'd be absolutely correct. <laughs> um, but Future Corp is one of the other ex Unissa corps that. We do a lot of stuff together with. Um, they're also very good. Uh, so if you want to look at wormhole space, but you're not really interested in ledge farmers, I would recommend you go and chat to them. Um, yeah, they're also a good bunch of guys. Um, yeah, and I think they might be slightly less assholeish than us. And Trekkie as well. I can't forget Trekkie. But they don't come out to play as often as Future Corp. They don't, no. It makes me sad. Come out and play that's, with us. That's because we're really, really lazy about re-rolling our holes. You're lazy about <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, we like to do things the easy way. Bring capitals. It makes it much easier to roll wormholes. Yeah, bring capitals. Yeah, but then you have to scan, and then you have to find a K-space exit, and ugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a one little C3 static. We can roll that and, like, tie them up. Well, why would I want to re-roll my static when I've got two instrumentals in my static right now? That's a billion gas worth of risk. 
Because it's got to be a But it's a billion isk. For those that don't know, an instrumental is a LADAR site. It has 6,000 uh, C320. If you look up C320 on the market, I think you'll see why he's interested in keeping everything closed until he can get all that harvested. Yeah. You're looking at only about a billion. Um, I think that clock's in at about 150, 160 million an hour. In all fairness, I have actually been completely abstaining from any gas mining for the last week and a half because, yes, it is so boring. Yes. I don't do it if I lose something expensive and need a new one. I'll do it if there's an instrumental, but unlike the rest of Trekkie, well, not the rest, but unlike many people, I will not do it for the lesser gases. Join the club. Yeah. Oh my god, okay. a, a thing. I've discovered a thing. Oh, you can right click on Yakka's link to C320. They've added the ability to add harvestable cloud to overview. <gasps> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When they do that. Right. right. Since forever. Before we actually completely drift off, are there any more questions um, from from any people about? Wor- I mean, we can also answer some some general wormhole questions, I suppose, uh, yeah. if people are interested. Uh, yeah, um, so I'll just Malcolm's question in how can you do boost production in a wormhole? Yes, you can. Uh, you will need to ferry in the boosting materials from K Space, though. Uh, you don't get the, all the LADARs in here are for fillerites, which are used in tech free production. Um, you don't get any uh, actual boosting clouds out here. Uh, however, what you do get, those, you do tend to get a lot of null sex, especially in Class 5. Um, I used this joke again because I used it earlier, but I'm also currently uh, getting null sex. Um, get out. Get out, yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, you do tend to get a lot of null sex wormholes, and you can pop in there, you know, ninja some gas clouds out from under the residents, especially if it's in their downtime. You know, back, uh, we personally don't do it, but. We don't use lock boosters because, yeah, don't do drugs, kids stay in school. Lies. Which is why we're all uni dropouts, isn't it? Yeah. Well, speak for yourself, I was never in the uni. Well, yeah, that doesn't make it any better, does it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> if from a connection as the link in on board to a prime example of how to use chips in these days. James, your connection is horrible. It's very hard to understand what you're saying. All right. Thank you, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> um, he said he linked something in Mumble. Right. Uh, more questions? One thing I have to add, as someone who has just joined a, a wormhole corp, is that uh, it would be very uh, beneficial to you and the corp to train gas harvest, gas cloud harvesting to level five. The skill book is a little bit steep at around 22 million, but the training time is a max of a week or so, and that you can get take good, make very good money harvesting gas in the relative safety of your static or your first out or second out. So even if you can't fly those very, very fancy ships, uh, you can still make very good money using harvesting gas. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is what it, gas harvesting is one of the biggest money makers out in W space. Um, yeah, certainly for, you know, certainly for smaller groups, that's sort of two, three, four, Five, you know, you're looking at walking over a reasonable amount. Um, anything more than that, you're looking at, you know, sort of sites simply because, you know, you're having more people. One gas cloud is about 400 mil. Uh, of course, you start spreading that between 10 people, you're looking at 40 mil, and that's not great. You know, you start doing sites, you're thinking about 100, 120 mil per person. Yeah, um, there's a lot of money out here. Yeah, so. So now if people sometimes say, like, oh, they, they don't care, they lost the hack, or uh, they, they're flying cheap ships, so they're flying a hack, so now you know why. Uh, right. Um, any more questions, or should we wrap this up then? 
Uh, I mean, any general wormhole questions you know, that people want to yeah, know, yeah. you know, far away? And we did sort of schedule in a little bit more time for this, but I think we covered everything relatively quickly. So, yeah, if there's any um, general wormhole questions, shoot. Unless you're Rolk. Rolke asks a very important question. How do I find the wormhole? You have to log off Eve and go back to WoW, Rolk. That's what you need to do. You have those two in lead farmers, those people who like they're part of the corp but actually play WoW instead? We don't talk about those people. They're dead, they are they're dead to us. <laughs> you know, if you pod killed them, they wouldn't just be dead to you, they'd be dead. At least momentarily. Well, the pod podding is kind of standard operating procedure in a wormhole anyway. Yeah. I have a question. What are some of the more amusing lead farmer memes? Um, I don't think... Bestower on D-Scan. Bestower on D-Scan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to explain that. I'll just going like, to leave them with that. I'll, I'll explain it. Um, basically, what, what happened was, um, I believe we were running a site or something, um, and obviously you check D-Scan and... One of the ships on the scan was a bestower because somebody had let it float at a pause again. And after about, I believe, 40 or 45 minutes, one of our guys suddenly goes like, guys, 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 there's a bestower on the scan. Like, you know, like it's the end of the world and like we needed to get out and everything. And so it's kind of become the meme of being late. Yeah, that, that bestower had been on D scan the entire time we were clearing an instrumental site. Nice. Trekkie's biggest meme is shoot the CEO. Oh, That's terrible. Well. No, it, it's a fairly time-honored tradition. If the CEO is willing to leave the paw shields, he is a valid target. Still terrible. Don't you guys go getting any ideas? Um, You're safe, yeah. sets the CEO. Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. Sets that's the call, really. Anyway. You get no say in the matter. I have you, a very you're well under the thumb. Here. Very important role. Yeah, unfortunately, well, he gets to decide what the taxes are, so we can't quite afford to do that. Yeah, you guys are all paying me 50% tax for now on. Bitch. What? Well, well, suck it. Zach, just make me see you when you can get to shoot me. Seriously, you take people on like four or five infiltrations, and all of a sudden everyone wants to be CEO. Yep. Well, you can do and you won't be in charge anymore. Sorry, James, I've missed that completely. you really broken up. Fuck. <laughs> Got that, though. <laughs> yep. Any more questions? I know I've asked that by about ten times now, but uh, we were done a little bit quicker than I anticipated, so... Uh... Do you guys use Tengus? Uh, uh, I... That's probably the best one to answer this. Yeah, Unar, go ahead. Uh, certainly, the uh, North American time zone ha tended to have a lot more uh, shield tank people or those people that were trained in shield tanking. So we did start running some Tango gangs in the North American, ti uh, you know, the Eastern time zone, well, the American time zone. And we have been fairly successful with um, fleets down to, say, five or six people to uh, run those. We fit them as remote rep, and um, that's worked out pretty good. Any specific questions that you were looking for? Why does the rest of your corp insist on using inferior armor ships? Because my well, IQ is higher than six. All right, if we're going the armor ship, if when you're repping from sleeper, when you're doing PVE, it, now listen, I'm Kildari, okay, so I won't say this even though it hurts me. It does do a better job because it takes less capacitor to heal up a, a higher amount of armor than it does capacitor to heal up a shield. Basically, you use one capacitor to heal up one shield, you use one capacitor to heal up two armor. So when your ship are capacitor dependent, that helps out a lot with them. Plus, three races use armor, where one race mainly use shields. I'd also add that, um, especially using capitals, uh, the only ship that has a, a range bonus to their cap transfer, as well as any logistics, is the Archon, and their only bonuses are for armor. So uh, when you have blaster boats that get neutered out, that are dealing your damage, you can you can cap them back up, and to do that you have to run armor. It's not quite true, actually. The uh, Chimera gets a bonus to energy transfer as well, and shield reps. 
who flies that? It's pointless. Oh, yeah, unless you fly shield, gang. I mean, I don't think shield or armor is quite as important anymore when you fly, uh, when you have capital uh, support, but obviously we started out with rem rep battleship gangs, and it was just much easier to get cap stable flying armor battleships with armor rem rep, so I guess half the reason why the corp is that is simply because of the way we grew into where we are now. Although to add some bonuses to the shield side, there are certainly wormholes out there, certainly types of wormholes out there, which give a bonus to shields. And notice sleepers do not have any shields, so they don't gain that same bonus. There's other wormholes which give a bonus to armor, and the sleepers and you get that bonus, so that doesn't really help you out as much. That's true, pulsars. One final thing about repping, notice that it's good for the shields, is notice the shield gets its rep at the start of the cycle, where the armor gets its, when the armor is repping another ship, the ship that's being repped will get its addition to armor at the end of the cycle. Yeah, so, so that means that shield can, is a little bit better if you have to do a sudden emergency rep where you don't have to wait for the uh, cycle of the module to finish. But the ship modules also give you a very bigger signature. Yes, they do. So that obviously goes uh, isn't a very good thing if you're trying to signature radius tank. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I think we've kind of covered everything. Um, so I will uh, close the class here. Um, Thank you all for coming, and uh, yeah, I hope you learned something from it. Uh, one final thing, if you do think of a question after the class or something like that, or if it pertains to wormholes, or even if it doesn't, just hop in the Elf Farm channel and ask away, no problem. Even if you're not considering joining, we're happy to answer your questions. Yeah, and as we say, if you are thinking of uh, moving out to wormhole space, just give us a shout. Yeah, we're more than happy to go through some of you.